So I'm going to take, walk you through the agenda um, for the webinar itself, because we it's a little bit packed. Um, so to start with, we would like to quickly share with you why uh, we, Frida and Mama Cash, commissioned this research. Then we'll hear from Maria Fernanda Salazar directly, the lead research consultant who will introduce a report and two speakers today, hopefully, um, Soria and Jonah, to who are two of the co-researchers from U well, Uganda and the Philippines respectively, who participated on this research as girl advisors. Following their presentations, Maria Fernanda will share her thoughts on doing participatory research with girls. And then Sadat from Frida will share a few takeaways from the report um, before we move into a Q&A session, after which we will close the call. So that is our agenda for today. So why girls? Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, girls and organizations and or initiatives are important to show social movements. Despite challenges, girls around the world are organizing and joining forces to have their agency and autonomy recognized, respected, and celebrated. Mama Cash and Frida, two women's funds long committed to supporting girls and their organizing, decided to commission a research study to find out more about how girls are organizing across the world. Through our experience of supporting girl-led groups and organizing, we realized that we needed and wanted to get a better understanding of how this organizing is different. Focusing on girls as leaders and girl-led groups that operate with little or no adult supervision. So the purpose of this was to know who are the girls, how and where are they organizing, what motivates them, how can they be reached and best supported. To start answering these questions, this study was jointly commissioned and applying a, a participatory research, feminist and intersectional approach. This research was an exciting opportunity to show how funders can, be, um, can provide flexible support that responds to the needs of girls and their organizing. And it also paved the way for, uh, for the effort to begin mapping girl-led initiatives around the world. So without further ado, I would like to invite um, our lead researchers to tell us a little bit about their key findings and learnings of this report. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of iWorks Global and of the entire research team, I want to thank you so much for joining us. We are really very excited by this project and by the interest it has generated. Uh, I'm really happy to see so many people today and we've gotten some really good uh, messages with great feedback on, on the reports. We're very, very happy about that. And I'm especially excited to have our girl co-researchers with us today. Uh, but before giving them the floor, I want to also give a shout out to our other girl advisors. Uh, we had seven uh, girl advisors who participated in the study. And I know that some of them are joining us today, although they will not be presenting. So I want to, again, thank them so much for being here and for all their hard work. Um, girls, you're all rock stars, and we feel really happy to have been able to collaborate with you. We really feel incredibly lucky and honored to have had the opportunity to have worked with such an incredibly talented group of girls and young women. Uh, from our side, the quote unquote adult side of the research team, it was really a fantastic learning experience to have been able to lead this intergenerational research team. And we are very excited with the results. And we hope that um, our work and this report, the webinar and the case studies contribute to continued and increasing support um, for girls and their initiatives. I also know that many of those who are joining us today participated in the study. I, I see many familiar names and I'm sure that many of you spoke with myself or with um, our girl advisors or other members of the team. And I wanna say a big thank you to all of you. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for sharing your experiences. And thank you so much for all the incredible work that you do with girls uh, and in supporting their initiatives. Needless to, needless to say, uh, your contributions were invaluable and we couldn't have done it without you. So thank you so much. Now I would like to give the floor to Jonah and Saria. They are two of our girl advisors and they will be sharing with us some of our key findings from this study and some recommendations uh, that we came up with in supporting girls and their initiatives. So Jonah, the floor is yours uh, to tell us a bit about the characteristics of girls organizing. Yeah, um, thank you, Maria. Uh, hi, uh, good evening everyone from the Philippines. Um, I'm Jonah. Uh, one of the girl advisor of the Girls to the Front research. Uh, currently, I'm a She Decides Seat Champion and a member of the guiding group or advisory of the movement. 
Uh, personally, I believe that the population of girls today is naturally and simply doing and motivating of what they think is needed in the society uh, for the sake of making a difference. They don't have, I mean, the consciousness and even the at some point, even the vocabulary of what feminism is. But as they learn and grow inside the structure and organizations that they are part of, they develop this awareness and they see to themselves that, yes, they are feminists and what they love to do truly contributes to their peers and their society. And I think that's what we should all invest in. So now uh, I'm moving forward to the key findings and characteristics of girl organizations. So based on our research, um, we are very definite that girls do organize everywhere across the globe in different ways, in different forms, and in different capacities. Um, we found out that girl organizations are small in number, those that we, we are calling um, standalone. Uh, we've only identified and interviewed fewer than 20. Uh, honestly, I haven't interviewed any girl organization in the Philippines because some of them, they don't consider themselves as girl -led. Uh, all of the work and the contacting are done online, and this became a barrier because not all girls and girl-led organizations have access to the internet. And mostly, um, girl-led organizations are also informal in na nature. Um, girl-led organizations uh, operate uh, within other organizations, within uh, girl-centered organizations, in a way for them that this might be... Uh, these are some, sometimes the, be, uh, the best or sometimes the only way uh, for them to uh, operationalize. So case in point is uh, Princess Center in Mongolia. This led by women and they consider themselves as a girl-centered organization. And they established the formation when they were still girls. But at the present, they do have uh, girl clubs wherein girls organize, but still under the Princess Center uh, supervision. So the reason... Uh, why they are actually fine being not fully independent or because uh, one, um, money is challenging. Um, it is too uh, expensive to get registered. For example, is uh, from a neighboring country in Thailand. Um, they pay for $6,230 just for them to be registered. And this requires a lot of paperwork for the registration process and it is actually very complicated to do a registration for a girl uh, led. And this also requires a lot of resources. And we also uh, found out that girls do not always organize as adults would, nor they want to. So this is how um, different uh, the girl led organizations are, or the girls and, uh, girl organizations are from adult organizations. Because um, girl organizations are more flexible. And they are very fine with the current setup that they have. And adult organizations are mostly uh, full-time work. And girl organizations is not the center of their lives because we know that girls still go to school. Some do have other work and some juggle the activities inside the organization with their school activities and family activities as well. And girl organizations are different in decision-making and structure. Um, girl organizations are very horizontal and direct in structure and have more demo democracy in terms of organizing because um, they see that every girl is seen as equal, for example, in consulting, uh, in uh, decision making. That's why um, hierarchical structure doesn't fit in girl organizations. And we also found out that we can clearly see that um, the motivation of girls to organize is actually not only for social change, but actually for their personal growth and the personal growth of their girl peers. So thus, um, these organizations became uh, support groups, became support systems, and it became a safe space where they can be true to themselves. That's why um, hierarchical structure isn't really that applicable. And finally, um, uh, we also want to emphasize that um, despite them uh, being unregistered and less formally established, um, they have the capacity to lead all these initiatives. So um, that's it for the first part. And I'll be giving the floor to Sarah as well to talk about the barriers of the girl uh, organizing.
Thank you, Surya. I mean, Jonah, yes. sorry. And Surya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm Surya Winnie Nalvega from Uganda. Uh, personally, um, I'm very passionate about I'm very passionate about gender and all the issues to, and all the issues concerning girls. I currently work with an organization called Hands of Hope Initiative. It's a community-based organization. It's girl-centered, girl-focused, and also girl-led. I got my inspiration from my personal experience. When I had just joined high school, we were around 200 girls in a class. And, and by the time we reached, we reached half, of the, half of the study, we were around 25 girls in a class. So many of them were dropping out due to teenage pregnancies, first marriages, and, and also early marriages. And due to that cause, a few months ago, I got an opportunity to join a team of seven girl advisors around the world and to research on, to research on how girl-led organizations are operating. Then when we came, during the research, we came to realize that there are barriers to girls organizing and these barriers are universal. They are not only in Uganda, but also in other areas around the world. And firstly, we came out with we came we came to realize that stereotypes about adolescents is also a very a very significant barrier to girls organizing. And these stereotypes are mostly manifested in our cultures. I mean, every culture has, every society has different cultures and stereotypes that they're assigned to girls. For example, guys, girls are supposed to be shy. Girls are supposed to be submissive. And there is no way a girl who is shy, who is submissive, will be able to become a leader, will be able to become a voice to the voiceless. And there is no way a girl who is shy will be able to stand up and speak in public. And this is because also the parents feel that they should, they, they should raise their girl child in a way that they were raised. Because for example, me in my culture, uh, a girl is, supposed to, is not supposed to look uh, uh, a man in the face. You're not supposed to look at any man in the eyes. You're not supposed to have any eye contact in other words. So there is no way a girl who is brought up in that in that community, who is brought up in the society, will come up to lead an organization, will come out to lead an initiative. So this, this, this hinders girls from organizing. And also we have, we have the feminists, the feminists, the feminists. These feminists also believe that, although they, these feminists have tried to help out girls, they have also hindered them from organizing in a way that they undermine them. They believe that they, um, they don't have enough experience to run an organization. And they also believe, and they also believe that the girls do not, do not, do not have the necessary equipment to lead an organization. So these, these feminists greatly hinder the organizing of girls around the world. And then also we, we looked at the restricted, the restricted agency and mobility, whereby girls are greatly restricted from moving from one place to another. For example, in male culture, a girl is not supposed to, to move, a girl is not supposed to move out beyond 6 p.m. By 6 p.m. you're supposed to be in the house. And, and then if you're, if, even if during the day you are supposed to move out, you are supposed to go with your brother, who is, a, who is a male, and then also some other person who is older than you. So this, you, you find that there is no way a girl would organize, maybe form a group with others, come out, come out and speak about the, the, the issues that they are, the issues that are affecting them. Then the closing space for civil society. 
these civil societies are, have put up laws which are hindering girls from organizing. And these laws, like the, the process of registration, it's really hard for girls, young girls below 18 years to organize. And, and for that, they put up those, they, they put up restrictive laws to limit them from, maybe from registering their organization. Like for example, you have to walk from one office to another. Then after that, you also have to pay some money. It, and, and in which these girls do not have the money. So this, this slowly kills their morale of organizing and it kills their spirit. Then we also have the bullying and harassment of girls. Uh, girls are being bullied, for example, uh, during the research, uh, one of the girls was like, she was accused of having an affair with a white man just because she was fighting against, against other marriages in her community. And then you find out that the community members, the people in the community who are supposed to lead and guide the girls are the very people that are limiting girls from becoming leaders. Just because of us saying that our girls are not, are not supposed to be leaders. Right now we live in a patriarchal society where masculinity is the order of the day. They, everything, the leaders uh, in, in politics everywhere, they're supposed to be men. So it, that mentality, that forces the girls not to organize. And, and, also, and also other, other factors affect girls from organizing. So, uh, I also have a saying that we should we should we should teach girls to be good leaders but not good followers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Surya. Um, I think you can all see why we were so excited to work with these amazing girls. Thank you so much to both of you for being here with us and uh, for sharing. All of that, and I will I will give the floor back to you both in a minute. Um, now, obviously, for us, the most exciting component of this research was the fact that we were able to collaborate and work together uh, with our girl advisors. We really wanted this research to be completely participatory and for girls to be at the center of it and to lead it from beginning to end, which is why we included seven girl advisors from all over the world as full members of our research team. Uh, the girls were our guiding light in this process, and we were really very lucky to have their support and participation. Now, those of you who have already read the report uh, know that one of the main findings from our study was the need for intergenerational collaboration, as the girls mentioned, and we truly feel that this study is a great example of the need for it and of what can be achieved when women and girls work together towards a common goal. Um, I also just wanna mention that in addition to our girl advisors, we had as part of our research team uh, young women researchers whose contributions were also invaluable and which further our intergenerational work. So I also want to thank them as well for their participation. Now, the process of working together as an intergenerational research team and of implementing this participatory research was uh, truly a learning process for all of us. And so we wanted to share with you some of the lessons that we learned along the way, as well as some recommendations for implementing similar initiatives in the future. So, uh, and I know that some of these are things that perhaps you already know or that you, know, you may be familiar with or may not seem so out there, but really is something for you to consider and to keep in mind whenever you want to implement um, processes such as this one, which we highly recommend. Now, the first thing would be uh, to plan for extra time. And this is true of any participatory research, not just in working with girls. Obviously, when you are, you know, quote unquote, professional researchers or when you're dedicated to this, uh, as a profession or because it's your job, you know, it's your priority, so you dedicate full time to it. Then we, when you involve girls or members of the community or whoever it is that is participating in your uh, participatory research, obviously they have many other things going on. So, you know, girls have school, they have family responsibilities, they have extracurricular activities, they have their social lives, they have a lot going on. So they really don't have a lot of extra time to dedicate to research activities. So understandably, 
processes that involve them take much longer than when it's just um, professional researchers involved. So something to keep in mind uh, to plan and um, to make sure that you include it uh, when organizing uh, participatory research studies. Another thing to keep in mind, very important, is to be flexible with time and methodologies. So when planning work and activities that involve girls, make sure to consider their personal lives. For example, keep in mind when they have school holidays, when they have exam periods scheduled, when you know they have other things that may take up extra time so that they are able to fully engage with the research. Um, also, girls may feel more or less comfortable with certain types of methodologies, and they may at times uh, require more extensive support than adult researchers or less support. So be prepared to adapt as needed. You know, girls feel more comfortable with certain tools and certain methodologies, or they may feel a little bit less comfortable. So you should really be responsive to their needs. And in line with that, um, though we we always tend to think that you know young people, girls, children, they make use of technology and they feel very comfortable with it. And that's true uh, in many instances when they do have access to it. And then when we say technology, we mean not just new technologies, but you know, radio and other things as well. Um, so although that is true, they may not be uh, familiar with the same tools that adults generally use. So for example, we tend to use things like Microsoft Office or things like that, whereas girls and young people may feel much more familiar with other forms of new technologies, with you know new applications, with social media, Facebook, WhatsApp, you know, whatever it is that they use. So don't assume that because they are young people, they have a handle on technology. Just you know, be responsible to be responsive to their abilities. So assess their abilities and then be ready to provide support as needed, um, because. You may have to provide extra support in some uh, applications and technology, or they may be able to <laughs> provide support to you in other uh, new technologies. Another thing that we that we found out in working with girls was uh, the value of Facebook and other social networks, which of course we all know. But um, really, with the research, we realized that the use of Facebook goes beyond. Um, you know, the personal lives of girls and young people, but also it extends to their professional endeavors. So many girl organizations may not have, for example, a web page, but they will have a Facebook page. So really they will use Facebook, not just uh, to post content um, of their personal lives or, you know, anything like that, but actually they use it uh, as an organizational tool. So be prepared to use Facebook and other social uh, networks when engaging with girls. And the same goes for, for example, WhatsApp. We realized that although we are more more used to perhaps using Skype or other other tools uh, to communicate, most of the interviews, in fact, that we had with girls were held um, through WhatsApp because it's just an application that girls use more. So be prepared uh, to be flexible in that respect and to use these new applications um, that girls are using. Now, if you're engaging girls locally, uh, make sure to engage their entire communities. So if families and communities understand the value of girls' involvement in research, they will react more positively to it and they will be uh, more willing to support girls in their endeavor. Um, so it's important to engage their families and if the girls are working in their communities, then make sure to also involve community leaders and to get them on board with the initiative. It's important to share with them, you know, what you're doing, why you're doing, what the involvement of the girls will consist of, so that they understand, you know, if they are doing any work in the community, what they are doing, why they are doing it, and uh, sort of what will come of it. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Also to keep in mind, um, very important to always remember the principle of do no harm. So, Depending on the social cultural context that girls live in, it may be more or less acceptable for them to participate in research initiatives. So before involving them, make sure that you consider the potential risks of them being involved uh, in your research initiative. And if any of them are identified, make sure that you establish a plan, a plan to mitigate them. Um, if you see that those risks cannot be mitigated, then consider whether girls should be participating in it at all. Uh, of course, always prioritize the safety of the girls and their well-being over um, the study. And finally, 
when in doubt, just ask. <laughs> I know that uh, many of us who have been working in the field of youth participation, we often believe that we are very clear on what it takes to ensure youth involvement and participation that goes beyond tokenism. But uh, sometimes that doesn't mean that we are not having an adult centered perspective. So really it's important to make sure that the participation of girls is real, not just from our perspective as adults, but from their perspective as well. So if you're not sure about something, then make sure that um, you ask, you talk to the girls and you involve them throughout the entire process. Um, as I said, for us, this was a very, very, very rewarding process. Um, we were very, very happy to engage with the girls and we are very excited with the results and uh, to be able to continue collaborating with the girls in, in issues such as this webinar. And uh, I would like to give the floor to both Jonah and Saria uh, for them to share with you a bit about their experience in participating in this research study and uh, what they think about girl participatory research. So girls, uh, Jonah, if you want to begin. Hi, oh yeah. Um, Actually, uh, the research uh, really um, opened a lot of um, different uh, perspectives for me. Uh, I've learned a lot of uh, different cultures because I interviewed a lot uh, in the Asia side. And uh, the research being participatory helped, helped me understand those different contexts and where they are coming from, these girls. And how different my context is from their context. And I think uh, what um, binds us as feminists, as young feminists, as girls, is that we all want to push forward uh, social change for girls around the world. And um, what's the good thing as well that this, uh, this is, um, this uh, that girls are also part of the interviewers is that the girls being interviewed became very comfortable. I can feel it in their uh, and their voice when I ask questions, and it and because the conversation is very light, you can also talk about some um, deeper uh, context and meanings of what's really happening in their context. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Joe. Now, uh, Saria, I'll give you the floor now to share a bit about your experience. Yeah, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, working, working on girl-led, working with girl-led organizations as, and in this research has been a very wonderful experience. Um, I didn't know anything about research, uh, but I also learned a lot. Uh, they taught me how to conduct the research, and then after. I conducted the research and it was a very wonderful experience. I came to realize that the issues that are affecting girls are not only in Uganda, because before I was like, maybe it's in Africa or what, but I came to realize that it's everywhere in Asia, in Europe. You will find that the, the, the issues that are affecting girls or the issues that are, are motivating girls to organize are the same. So this research really opened up my mind and also my eyes and came to realize that girls globally have the same have the same have the same experiences and also have the same barriers. So this research was really very impactful. Um, to organize uh, and also include some things uh, that I was not, and also include some things that, that I was not welcome that about in the organization. And yeah, it was, yeah. Thank you so much, Saria and Jonah. Uh, and now I will give the floor to Sadat, I believe. Thank you, Saria and Jana and uh, Maria Fernanda. So my name is Sadat. Um, I have been co-leading this research process at FIDA, the Young Feminist Fund, and 
just wanted to say thank you for joining the webinar. Received lots of responses and interest in this research and happy to have you all today with us. Um, and just to say that um, we, we as participatory grant, make, grant maker, we believe in a transforming power of girl activists to fully participate in social justice movements and placing voting selection and recommendation process in the hands of girls themselves, decentralized decision-making power and ensures uplifting um, groups, girl-led groups and organizations expert, expertise. Um, and we aim to recognize and understand power relations, age specificities and diversity of experiences and backgrounds of girls and girl-led groups. For this reason, FRIDA advanced a meaningful girl participation in um, its governance, specifically through advisory committee. And girl advisors are bringing their expertise and perspective into advisory, um, FRIDA advisory to shape FRIDA's support to girl-led and girl-centered groups. Um, girl advisors play key role in advising on girl issues supporting with specific outreach um, to reach girl-led groups and in each of the region. And uh, also girl advisors represent Frida's advocacy work and co-leading um, uh, advocacy work together. And, um, and as, um, as Frida, we practice intergenerational approach. Girl advisors are part of the larger like advisory committee that has around 60 advisors around the world, um, different ages, and everyone is up to 30 years old. Yeah, but there's also the much of diversity and everyone, like despite their age, they work closely with um, advisors um, from different ages and different regions. We see this intergenerational advisory work that we have at FRIDA as a good example of building relationships, very practical relationships between um, different generations and solidarity while striving for the same goal. And uh, from this process and just in the general uh, funding girl, uh, young feminist activism, um, we uh, learned that um, to continue, um, we see that young women, trans and intersex youth play important role in bridging intergenerational divides and supporting girls to enter feminist movements. We see almost a quarter of Frida Grantee partners and advisors are working directly with girls, involving them meaningfully in activism, through camps, clubs, consciousness raising, and crit critical discussion circles, um, and the young feminists working with girls, um, contributing a lot to girl leadership by working with their parents, involving entire communities, acting as fiscal sponsors, acting as chaperones, and practicing mutual learning process. So supporting young feminist groups also act as a, yeah, acts as a breach between generations. And, uh, and I think through, throughout this uh, research and in general, we do agree that um, young feminist groups and self-led groups are the ones who have expertise in their own area and um, should be getting support. Um, and in terms of uh, commitment, um, we, as Frida is we in the middle of strategic planning and for us it's a great opportunity um, um, to consult more girls and to learn how they envision um, our role in supporting their leadership in the next five years. And, um, and here girl, Frida Girl Advisors plays, um, play a very important role um, in ensure that girls' perspectives are included in strategic plan. And, in the coming years, we also would like to explore more how funders, how we ourselves could be responsive to the needs of girl groups and, um, and come up with practical tool to assess funder capacity um, and uh, whether 
uh, funder are responsive to the needs that girl-led groups and girl-centered groups are uh, having um, and properly respond to that. And yeah, we believe that continuous supporting um, self-led groups, young feminist groups that are advancing girl power and leadership in the movements is critical. And, um, and also we plan to, with that learning, based on that, we plan to deepen and strengthen our ongoing support for young feminist groups led and centered by girls. Um, and of course, providing the necessary support that they identified. Um, so in, we have now time um, for the questions. And I saw there's um, already two questions posted in the chat box. So I will be um, reading the question and we'll see um, if Sandra or not I or Surya and Jona um, or Maria Fernanda could take a question. Um, so yeah, there's a question from Lucy from Plan International in West Africa. Um, she has two questions. The first one is around how you identified and reached girls groups in informal and offline spaces. Um, and the second question is around whether you plan to make available the mapping, the list of girl-led, girl-centered organizations mentioned in the research. Um, so I think the first question, um, I was wondering if Marie Fernando or uh, could support with responding to that. And the second one, maybe we could share between me and Sandra. Sure, uh, I'll take the first one. So thank you, Lucy, for your question. Uh, as, as you saw in the report, and as we mentioned, one of the, the main challenges to this research study was the fact that it was conducted primarily online. So of course, we had some limitations into the the groups that we were able to reach and to identify, um, especially those that were, for example, in rural areas where they may not have access to, to internet. Uh, we did our best to conduct the cascade mapping, uh, meaning that we worked from, from the top down. So from international organizations working our way down to local organizations. Uh, one of our main sources of uh, information and of uh, being able to identify girls um, and their initiatives, especially those that were more informal and perhaps don't have a presence online, were uh, women's funds. So women's funds in many areas, many regions of the world, uh, support girl-led initiatives and organizations, and some of them support girl initiatives that are not registered. So they were a very good uh, source of information and of identifying girl-led groups and organizations that we wouldn't be able to identify through, let's say, traditional online spaces. And we worked a lot with uh, kind of the word of mouth. So every every girl and every girl organization that we spoke with, uh, they normally would refer us to other organizations and to other groups. And, you know, they knew other girls that, that were also organizing. So that was um, sort of our main source of information. And we recognized that it was a limitation that the study was conducted primarily online. So we know that we may have missed out on many wonderful groups and organizations that, you know, may not have a presence online, but because of the limitations with uh, budget and timing, we, of course, were not able to identify every, every girl-led group uh, and organization. But as I mentioned before, also the power of Facebook, uh, it was a great tool that we used a lot and we realized that not all of the groups were there, but as I said, identifying those smaller groups through Facebook then led us to even, uh, let's say, more informal groups uh, in other spaces. Thanks, Maria Fernanda. Um, Sandra, do you, do you feel you would like to start answering the second question about making available the list of girl-led groups mentioned in the research? 
Yeah, I, I think uh, towards the end, you can send us an email directly. Uh, we do have that information available and then we can, uh, whoever is interested, we can, um, we, you know, it's, it's because obviously for privacy reasons, we don't want to publish, you know, names of all the interviewees. I mean, you do have most of the information on the report. Um, and, and those that are the, the names that are in the report is basically with consent of the girls. Uh, and if you want a list of organizations, we can provide it to you if you reach out to us directly. And you will see our emails at the end, either to Sadat or I. Thanks, Sandra. Yeah, and I would also like to add that we share, like, in a reminder, the health been also shared, like, a, a re the case studies zine that we will we'll publish after this call. Um, it also has some of the organizations that featured in, have been part of this research. Um, so I see there's um, another question. I think there was additional question about did it, whether um, Francophone countries take part in the research. Um, Okay, so yeah. let me just ask first question. I think is uh, Michelle Lynn, I hope, from Burkina Faso. Um, and the question is, I would like to know the origin of the girls who participated in the research and um, what countries and did Francophone countries take part in the research? Um, maybe Jona um, or Sri want to start and then Maria Fernanda would follow up. Jonah or Surya, do you want to take the question? <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll be happy to, to start. Um, so our girl advisors uh, came from all over the world. We had, as you heard, uh, Jonah in the Philippines and Surya in Uganda. We also had a group of girls in Kenya. We had a girl advisor in Bolivia, and we also had a girl advisor in Kyrgyzstan. So the the reason why we didn't select these girls in any for any particular reason the countries themselves just they were the girls that um, we identified and that were um, interested in becoming involved in the initiative. Uh, each of the girls, in addition to speaking English, uh, spoke local languages and spoke you know second or third languages, and they were able to reach out to girl girls and girl like groups. Uh, who perhaps only spoke those languages. For example, I believe uh, Jana in Kyrgyzstan spoke Russian. Uh, I don't know if that, I think perhaps you can correct me on that. Um, and I know that uh, Maria Rene in Bolivia, of course, spoke Spanish and they were able to reach out to to other other girls who also spoke their, their mother tongues and second and third languages. Uh, in terms of Francophone countries, uh, yes, we interviewed many, many girls and many organizations from Francophone countries. We didn't have someone on the team who spoke uh, French, but we were able to, to communicate with them in, in English or Spanish or other languages that we did speak. And also uh, one of the methodologies that we used for some of the girls um, or organizations that we were not able to interview directly, we also had questionnaires and we had the questionnaire, the online questionnaire uh, translated into several other languages and French was one of those languages. So yes, we did involve girls and organizations from Francophone countries in the research. Thanks, Marie Fernanda. Um, Jonah or Surya, if anything you would like to add about your country of origin? Okay, perhaps you could also add in, if there's connection issue, you could also try to um, use chat box to, to share that information. Um, so uh, the next question, so I see um, Dr. Shekharu, um, I think it's a palliative physician and founder of Orikalan Kini, or organization that's changing narratives around menstruation and sexuality in India through art, theater, and dialogue. Um, and um, question is, as Frida Fund technolo 
uh, Frida Fund Technological Feminist Initiative and how does one apply? Um, yeah, just to quickly uh, uh, say to that, that we support emerging young feminist uh, groups around um, in five regions of the world um, and we'll be opening up call for propos proposals and this announcement will be widely shared and we could include your email as well to share that with you um, and, and perhaps the group that you might know who wants to apply um, could yeah definitely submit the application. Um, so the next question from uh, Lucia. Um, thank you for your inspiring conversation. My question is how this research was distributed among governments starting from the local level and what was what were the reactions to it? Um, so um, about distribution, um, I don't know, Sandra, would you like to start and I could add to that? Sure. Hi, Lucia. Thank you for your question. Um, so we have been working hard on dissemination and we started, we launched this first at the Human Rights Funders uh, Conference in Mexico City in October. So we started first within the donor community, the philanthropic donor community. Um, and so through that, it has been spread out uh, during the, uh, different channels. We have not shared this at with local government level yet, um, obviously because of we have language limitations at this point, this report is mostly available in English only. Um, but we have heard uh, from the Office of the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, where they want to incorporate some of those findings on their work on uh, human rights, uh, girl human rights defenders. Um, and so far, like that is, um, you know, one of the ways that we're hoping that we continue. Uh, obviously, this report is, is new. Um, we just launched it on mid-October. And so our idea is to continue to roll it out next year. So if you have any ideas of, or if any particular governments that you would like to share this with, we're happy to, to, to talk and you can send us an email. We can have a conversation about it. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Sandra. I, I don't have anything to add to that, but yeah, completely agree with Sandra. Um, so the next question is, I think it's, uh, it's um, yeah, more sharing, right, uh, reflections. We um, are the doula, I hope I'm saying all of your names right, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we work with over 60 grassroots partners in India who are supporting girls in the geographies to collectivized while some of these groups are moving towards being more autonomous. Many keep connected with the grassroots organizations. And in order to highlight girls' voices and to build their constituency with supporting partners to facilitate girls convening where they converge across diversity and have opportunities to deliberate um, specific issues and build represent their voice. Love to keep connected to similar initiatives and learn more about how to support emergent girls groups. Um, yeah, that's a that's a that's a, um, thank you for sharing that. So I I think that is a great opportunity to meet uh, many people in in this call and um, and yeah, we we'll definitely keep you updated and share case studies. Uh, not only case studies in, but more a little bit later. Um, so there is another question about were any distinct um, organizing models identified across regions? Any specific learnings from cross regional collaborations? Um, and this is Tanya from Ford Foundation. Um, Marie Fernanda, do you think you could take this question? Sure, I'll be happy to tackle this. Uh, thank you for your question, Tanya. Uh, one of the things uh, that we we heard from girls a lot is that they really wanted spaces where they could collaborate with one another, to network, to get to know other girls, and to uh, find out about what girls were doing in other countries and other regions and other parts of the world or even in the next village over. So this is one of the main areas where girls felt that there was a lot to be done and that they really didn't have a lot of opportunities um, to do this, especially girls who are perhaps not the ones on the traditional radar of, of donors. So 
the girls who maybe are leading smaller groups or smaller organizations that they felt they really wanted to have those opportunities. Um, so they there is some cross-regional collaboration between girls and there are some platforms for that, but girls really felt it was one of the areas where they really wanted more support and wanted more opportunities. Uh, in terms of organizing models, uh, one of the one of the key key issues perhaps that conditioned whether or the way that girls were able to organize perhaps more independently or more under larger organizations was whether there was funding available for unregistered groups. In some regions of the world, because legally uh, unregistered groups cannot be supported, then girls tend to organize more under larger organizations. In other regions of the world where perhaps women's funds or other, other funders are providing funding to unregistered groups, then girls were able to organize more, let's say, independent of those larger organizations. So, um, of course, it has to do with uh, cultural reasons. It has to do with many, many reasons. But one of the main reasons that sort of determines uh, the organizing models in terms of how, of whether girls were able to organize um, independently, let's say, was whether there was funding available for unregistered groups because um, most of most girl-led organizations and groups are not able to register if uh, if they don't have a legal representative that is over 18. So I think this is one one factor to consider in terms of thinking about the organizing models that that we were able to identify. Thanks, Maria Fernanda. Um, yeah, just. Uh, we have two more questions and hopefully we can wrap up after that. So one of them is any learning and findings on, it, this is from Tenzin, sorry, any learnings and findings on if and or how girls are autonomously organizing and the resourcing they work. Um, Tenzin from Avid. Perhaps Maria Fernanda, would you like to take this question as well? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, one of the main main findings from from the research study was that, as we said, girls are organizing everywhere in the world. Uh, and I don't want. And I know that we said that we were only able to identify a small number of girl-led organizations, but that doesn't mean that girls are not organizing. It just means that girls are being very creative and they're organizing in other ways. So, in spaces, for example, as I was mentioning before, where girls are not able to secure funding for unregistered groups or they're not able to register or these things happen. Girls are being very creative and they're organizing in other ways. So autonomously organizing is not, uh, let's say, the most common way in which girls are organizing, but this is not because girls are not organizing or because they don't want to organize, it's just because of uh, some of the barriers that we mentioned that they're facing. So um, most girl-led initiatives uh, are organizing under larger organizations, um, but many of those initiatives have an important degree of autonomy in terms of programming, in terms of financial uh, resources and control. This is a little bit, um, they have perhaps less autonomy, but in terms of programming, they have a high degree of autonomy. So, um, so yeah, girls are uh, organizing autonomously to varying degrees depending on the context in which they operate. So I'll be happy to um, provide more information on that or some of the findings if you if you have any more more questions. Thanks, Mary Fernanda. And last question from Amina um, about uh, whether there are plans to expand this research and how are you seeing potential collaboration with other women's funds and funders to do that. Sandra, would you like to start? Thank you, Amina, for your question. Um, as Maria Fernanda mentioned briefly, women's funds were instrumental and part of this research, uh, particularly Fondo Lunaria in Colombia, which shout out if you guys are here. Um, uh, women's funds are incredibly connected to the movement and to the feminist movement, and they, they are one of the key mechanisms through which we uh, were able to reach out to several um, informal groups that are led by girls. And so we definitely 
are partnering with them and uh, sharing a lot of this uh, with them as this is mostly thanks to their work um, in terms of helping us reach out to the you know places so to speak that are difficult to reach um, at this moment we don't have plans to expand or build upon the research obviously because um, right now we just we're just starting on dissemination. Um, and so I think we will, we continue to, as we continue to spread it, um, the findings and um, continue to be in different spaces to talk about the findings, I think we will, if there's any particular feedback that you have, all of you that are present here today, we would love to hear it. If there's ways that we can go deeper into it, uh, we will t definitely take it into consideration so we can do a follow-up uh, later on. In the mean, um, but for right now, at this moment today, there aren't any plans. Um, but hopefully, again, as we get more feedback and see how this report rolls out, uh, we can make it happen. Uh, but thank you, definitely. Uh, we'll keep it into mind. Um, and so, unfortunately, we are running uh, towards the end and we want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so with this, I just want to do a brief closure. Thank you so much. Um, so Soraya, Jonah, Maria Fernanda, and Sadat and the organization of this webinar. Um, as you probably uh, heard, you know, the girls are amazing. They're organizing in so many ways that are different um, and unique and powerful. And so I hope that you got inspired as much as I did. Every time that we hear them talk, we're amazed and very humbled to be working with them on this. Um, so, and our emails have been put on the chat, but it's also on the next slide. Um, and you can, again, if there's any particular questions that you have, feel free to reach out to Sadat or I, and also Maria Fernanda was uh, put her email in there. Um, just so, so you know, let you know, today we published um, the final case studies in which we are highlighting particular organizations, which is really exciting. Uh, highlighting more, going more into depth into their work. You can find that at both at Frida and Mama Cash websites, and we'll be sending that to you as part as a follow-up to this webinar as well. And again, this webinar was recorded, and we'll be uh, sharing again this information with all of you. Uh, so the case studies, you can also get the report, and as well, uh, the webinar recordings. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you to um, everybody that made this happen. Thank you to Zora and Jonah again for your participation. As usual, we're humbled and very happy to be working with you. And everybody have a good day and have a good weekend. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.